Here is who Kanye West brought to dinner at Donald Trump's house last week. So you're either a Catholic or you're a Jew. You're either a Catholic or you're with the Jews. That's how it is. That's the way the world is. So anyway, that's that. And when are Catholics going to start asserting their control? I want Catholics to run this country, not Jews. I want this country to be run by Catholics, not Jews. And I don't think that's controversial. Even the cowardly lion, Mike Pence, who is not Catholic, by the way, is now saying that Donald Trump should apologize for having dinner with that guy who has been a public racist, white supremacist, anti-Semite for longer than Donald Trump was president. The poison that that guy spreads is shockingly new for some people, but our next guest has heard it all before and she captured it all in what is now the number one podcast in the Apple podcast rankings. The podcast is Ultra and the podcaster is Rachel Maddow. Rachel, have you had your little tea break between 10 p.m. and now? Okay, good. So, you know, <laughs> I said that I want the audience to ask all the questions here, and I'm going to stick to it. And I think the basic story of this podcast is going to emerge to people who aren't familiar with it yet. Uh, and if it doesn't, they desperately have to go out and, and listen, you know, turn on those phones immediately, listen to it. So this is, um, this is Dia Goldie, who, by the way, um, is a big fan and okay she says how did you get interested in this story find out about it to get started so i was interested in researching something that happened a little bit later on i'm interested in um holocaust denial and the origins of holocaust denial and how it has persisted this guy nick fuente so you were just showing clips of who had the dinner with Trump last week. Um, he's a Holocaust denier, and he's part of this uh, movement on the ultra-right right now to try to keep that nonsense alive. I was interested in the origins of that and how it kind of persisted through the 60s and 70s, and I ended up finding, like, a backstory to that thing that I was otherwise interested in that went back to this sedition trial and went back to what the United States was doing during World War II, particularly among people who didn't want us involved in World War II or who wanted us to be fighting on the other side. And when I got into the sedition trial stuff and realized what had gone on with this Nazi agent operating in Congress, um, I realized I had to tell that story before I did anything else. Okay, let's go to Erica Griffith, who says, what was the most fun thing you did, learned, most surprising thing, most valuable takeaway? And before you answer that, uh, any one of those uh, questions, Rachel, I have to give you the final note of, of, her, of her tweet. Also, I miss you nightly, and hi from New Zealand. <laughs> Please visit, and do, please visit and do a talk. I would love to come to New Zealand. I have no plans to do so. But if I am going to New Zealand, I'm probably fishing before I'm doing anything else. Um, that's very nice. Um, most fun, most interesting, biggest takeaway. Uh, a lot of it, I mean, it's obviously dark stuff, you know, so it's hard to say that it was, like, fun. But f tracing these folks in the world... Um, and finding where they ended up. And, you know, part of, I think, the reason why this is a forgotten story is that the political cost that was paid by a lot of people who were involved with its Nazi plot in Congress is that they got voted out of office and they died in obscurity. That was their accountability for having been involved in this stuff. And so, therefore, rediscovering them out of obscurity means it's like you're meeting whole new people. The senator who opens up episode one of the podcast, Senator Ernest Lundeen, like, nobody remembered that he existed at all. And so it was like finding a new character in fiction who had this whole backstory and this amazing wife and this incredible story after his death that all emerged that told what he had been doing before he died. And so it was that sort of pleasure of discovery, I think, was more than you usually get out of a history project, because so many of the people involved here who were powerful members of Congress and powerful senators did get flicked off the edge of the page in history because they were freaking Nazis or because they were involved with the Nazis. And that was right that that made them obscure, but it made it more fun to discover them.
Well, you also, I mean, this is Rachel Maddow doing a podcast, so there is fun, because Rachel Maddow's fun. Uh, you had some real fun uh, with Senator Lundin's wife and her hats, and, you know, <laughs> she, she's, she's also a dark character, if you give her a second thought, but, there, but there, there's, there's fun uh, around this thing. So there's a lot, this question, uh, there's a lot of versions of it. Would you ever give any consideration to making a visual version of this podcast and then Rachel there after that there's many questions about you know when is there going to be a movie and I will just speak <laughs> for the movie value of this okay I know a little something about Hollywood this is the most sought after movie rights package in the history of podcasting <laughs> uh we will no doubt be uh be hearing about that uh, at any moment but but Rachel I, the, the Talk about the, the, there's other questions in here about, what about a book? And so why, what, why, why a podcast? How about that? Because we, there may be other things that happened after it, but why a podcast? Part of the reason I wanted to do it as a podcast is because I think some of the audio that we found is amazing. A bunch of people have asked me, like, where did you find these actors to do these great 1940s accents? And do other... There's no actors in it. All of the audio, all of the tape is all original and authentic to the time. And so focusing on that, I mean, people were getting their news through the radio, and these are all radio broadcasts that we used in the clip. And so doing that in the podcast environment just felt real and direct and connected. But there's definitely going to be a book um, about it, which I'm already working on. And the book environment lets me not only tell these stories in a way um, that I was able to in the podcast, but also lets me sort of follow some of these plots further along in time um, and tell you sort of with more detail in, in, in chapter-based versions um, how some of these things pled to how some of these things came together. So there's good, the, the book will be a, a more intensive version of this, but I'm already like deep into that. For sure. Alan says, how was the America First movement and its plots impacted by the U.S. entry into World War II? Was our massive national mobilization against Germany central to snuffing out this right-wing extremism? Would something of similar scale be required next time? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it kind of cuts both ways, I think, in the history. I mean, the investigations that are the whole basis for the first half of the podcast all started before the U.S. got into World War II. But then the actual Great Sedition trial, that's the sort of basis for the, the back half of the podcast, um, it takes place uh, starting in 1944, uh, or, or during most of 1944, by which point we're deep into the war. And part of the way they brought those charges was not just that there were ultra-right fascist groups plotting an overthrow of the U.S. government, but that they were doing so in conspiracy with the Nazis, with the Hitler government in Germany, which we were then at war with. So that affected, I think, the way that they charged it. But I would also say that the when we won the war and the war ended and we sort of moved on as a country and started doing all the other stuff we needed to do in the post-war period, I actually think that contributed to all the sedition defendants and all their abettors in, in, in Congress being left off the hook. Because people thought, hey, listen, we, in terms of Nazi, Nazism and that threat, we went over there and we, we fought them there and we beat them and that threat is now over and we don't want to think about it anymore. And so these people who, who didn't get successfully prosecuted by the Justice Department sort of melted back into the sauce of American extremism. And in some ways, they have haunted us ever since. Uh, and here's one uh, from uh, Pesky's poll. It's, it's not a real name, but one of those Twitter names. Uh, yeah. What would you think is the number one takeaway for DOJ if they listened to the Ultra podcast, which I'm sure they are? It's the number <laughs> one podcast on the planet. You know Merrick Garland is listening to that at the gym. The, the A, thank you for that question. And maybe they're not listening to the podcast, but they do listen to you. And so I get to tell them right now. The takeaway for the Justice Department is do not be smug about this asserted value that nobody's above the law. The Justice Department, in fact, doesn't have a great record of holding people to account by the criminal law 
if that's a if they're a person who has a lot of political power. And saying that the Justice Department isn't influenced by political pressure, it isn't influenced by people threatening them politically, either threatening them in Congress or threatening them from the executive branch, the historical record shows that the Justice Department has been pushed around, that a senator threatens to increase oversight of the Justice Department unless a prosecutor gets fired. One attorney general fired a prosecutor for that reason. A pro the president fire, uh, pressured the attorney general to fire another prosecutor because that prosecutor had one of his friends in his sights. The Justice Department has not been great at holding people to account when they have a lot of political power, and they can't contend to the American people that that's not part of what happens in the United States unless they're honest about that past and they take steps to confront it and defeat those forces when they inevitably come knocking at their door again.